The idea, as she explained it to me, was simple enough. I would sit with her, I would talk with her, and share those few final moments of her life. She had no family left, she outlived them all. The same, sadly, was said for her friends and anyone else that she would have otherwise called on for that task. I remember she told me the worst part of a long life was the gradual removal of all things that make life worth living. I was offered this unusual position while supplying for a job only tangentially related to the kind of in-house care someone would provide to such an infirmed person. I suppose I had a look of youthful desperation about me, because one of the nurses at the facility, a tired-eyed woman not far from my age, asked if I'd like to make some money in the interim of my application's review. Naturally, I accepted, and was told about a kind-hearted 93-year-old widow nearing the end of her life. During our first phone call, the old woman had asked me to bring a few things, a tea kettle, a blanket, and a book of my choosing. On the morning of that fateful day, while finalizing our plans, she asked if I would read to her, and I happily agreed. I assumed the blanket and tea kettle were merely items of comfort, you know, two things that would be in their own way providing warmth to her, since she had spoken many times about how she'd recently been so cold. On the phone, we had never discussed payment. It had been offered, of course, and was, initially, the reason I accepted the somewhat morbid task. Fifteen hundred dollars to sit with an old woman during her final moments of life. A span of time that she assured me would last no longer than a few hours. She mentioned that her physician would, of course, remain in the house, stationed in another room, and ready to confirm uh, when it happened. Due to her condition, uh, the details of which I had never explicitly told, I was not allowed to visit with her prior to the curiously foreknown date of her death. As previously stated, we did, however, speak on the phone several times, and I learned a few things about her, the most notable being that she hadn't any surviving family members or friends, that she was truly alone in the world. She had explained briefly and vaguely her religious beliefs, which, as far as I could tell, belonged to no regular organized religion, but was a set of spiritual principles and mythic ideas to which she had closely adhered and devoutly followed since childhood. These beliefs, from what I gathered, were based upon some sort of obscure cosmic mysticism that she claimed was older than even the Abrahamic religions. She never lingered long on the topic, so there's not much else I could say about it. Over the phone, she was kind friendly, and surprisingly lively, at least vocally. For someone so close to the end, I actually found myself enjoying our conversations and quickly forgot about my original financial motivation. I wanted to meet this woman. I wanted to spend time talking to and laughing with her. When the day arrived, I drove to her house and parked in the driveway beside a car that looked like it hadn't moved in months. The sight saddened me. The idea that the woman was so mortally ill that driving herself around had been an impossibility for apparently quite some time. I'd never really experienced death before, you know, never closely. And here I was, about to witness it firsthand with a complete stranger. I walked up the front lawn's path to the door, knocked, and a voice issued from a speaker mounted beneath the doorbell, inviting me in. I entered noticed a row of shoes on a rack besides the door, and removed mine. I placed them on the second of three racks. The first was completely full, with shoes of varying sizes. Another speaker, mounted beside a mirror in the foyer, directed me rightward into a living room. In there I found the person with whom I was to spend the next hour or two. The room was wildly, densely decorated and furnished. There were pop culture memorabilia that dated back decades, even to my historically untrained eye, seemingly centuries. Sculptures, busts, stuffed figures, plates, framed pictures, and many other honorary and commemorative objects of yesteryear sat on shelves, were mounted to walls, or piled into the surface of tables and chairs. It was as if within the room the entire recorded history of mankind had compiled itself into both mass-produced objects of entertainment and prized, untouched possessions of collectors. 
and sitting amidst it all, in a chair that had been outfitted with health-monitoring machinery, was an old woman. The woman I was to sit with in her final moments. I introduced myself softly, but her response was loud, surprisingly bolsterous, considering her condition. On the phone, she'd been lively, but in person her mannerisms and volume of speech truly belied her age and physical state. She welcomed me into the living room and invited me to sit in a chair across from her. I removed the dolls that had been seated there and placed them with others on a nearby table, then unpacked the items I brought, the tea kettle and the book, wrapped in a thick, hand-sewn blanket, a gift from my late grandmother. I offered to drape the blanket over the woman's gown, which she agreed to, and then asked where the kitchen was, expecting her to want tea as soon as possible. But to my surprise, she told me to set the kettle aside for the moment, and asked that I do the same for the book. She wanted to talk first. She wanted to continue the last conversation we had over the phone. We chatted for about 30 minutes, and although our meeting had been planned around her expected expiration, I still had yet to ask exactly how she had arrived at the time. She had no attempt to hasten things along. Our, our chat drifted to related topics and circled back over after exhausting all conversational avenues. She was youthful in spirit, characteristically exuberant, even though her body had reached its biological limits. When thirty minutes had gone by, I asked somewhat anxiously if she liked me to put the kettle on and begin reading. She agreed to the tea, but said that she'd prefer to keep story time saved for later. I went to the kitchen and started the kettle, fished out two packets of hibiscus tea that she'd had in the cupboard, and set them beside two cups that had already been set out, presumably by her yet-to-be-seen aid. The kitchen wasn't nearly as decorated as the living room, but the same motif of memorabilia was still present. Coffee cups bore images of old-timey celebrities, while framed recipes showed classic cartoon characters, those in chef hats and aprons, holding various cooking utensils. It was cute, charming, a glimpse into the past well before my time. When the tea was ready, I brought it into the living room on a steel tray and set it on the table that was roughly between us, then delicately handed her a cup and a little glass plate. She thanked me, sipped from the cup, and asked me a fairly unusual question. What do you remember most fondly from your childhood? It took a moment for me to think of something, but I finally recalled how when I was seven, my dad had taken my brother and I on a camping trip. How much fun it had been to have nature all to ourselves. We'd spent the weekend fishing, exploring, watching animals, an experience that was for us closely sheltered suburban kids, you know, new, scary, mystifying at first. As I told the woman about the weekend, her face began to take on an even greater degree of excitement, as if she were drinking from the memories and regaining some semblance of her youth before my eyes. When I reached the story's conclusion, she clapped her hands, accidentally spilling the tea onto her lap. She yelped almost childishly and thanked me for having brought the quilt, otherwise the hot tea would have assuredly scarred her thighs. I scrambled up and asked her if there was any towels nearby. And still laughing, she pointed towards a closet at the end of the room, barely visible behind an antique armoire. I carefully slid the armoire aside, retrieved a few towels from a large stack therein, and would have gone back to the old woman if... if I hadn't seen something odd in the next room. When entering from the foyer, the living room had two exits. To the left is the kitchen, to the right. Beside the aforementioned closet is a threshold to another room. I hadn't noticed it before, just as I hadn't noticed the closet, but once beside it, I saw its door was slightly ajar, and through the slim open space, I saw someone sitting in a chair, facing away from the entryway. With my focus on my task being overruled by my curiosity, I entered the room. Unlike the room before it, this room was scarcely furnished. A bed, night table, box fan were the only objects in the room, aside from the person sitting in the foldable steel chair near a heavily curtained window. Despite the eclectic yet cozy decor throughout the rest of the house, 
I felt a strange, inexpressible atmosphere of hostility when entering this room. I sensed in a way that I can't describe that I... I wasn't welcome within the impersonal, Spartan space, but still, I continued on, drawing towards that unmovable figure in the chair by a weird magnetism, a volition that I wasn't sure was even my own. Still holding on to the towels, I walked around the chair, not wanting to startle the person by speaking or placing my hand on their shoulder. The chair was directly in the scope of the window, and yet the thick curtains allowed only the faintest of rays to filter through. There was no lights, and the space outside of that illuminated square was draped in a gloom that seemed unnatural, ominously manufactured. When I rounded the chair and came face to face with the person sitting therein, I dropped the towels and nearly fell to the floor from the shock of what I saw. The person sitting in the chair wore scrubs, and I'm sure that these had fit snugly at some point in their life, but the fabric that draped from the shriveled body seemed several sizes too large. Both portions of the outfit were also darkly stained in various places and bore signs of savage violence. The fabric over the stomach had been torn and the flesh beneath was shredded. The brown, decayed skin hanging in loose tatters. The most appalling aspect was the face, or the lack thereof. The hair had fallen out, or had been ripped out, leaving the scalp bald, and between the forehead and the neck there existed only a gaping hole, a horrible, gruesome cavity, bereft of even the remnants of a skull. The head was held upright by some post-death seizing of the body, a faceless, statuesque lifelessness that would inspire nightmares after nightmares in the days after. I honestly doubt I screamed. In that dreadful moment, I could barely breathe, and yet the old woman came ambling into the room, claiming that she'd heard me cry out. Her eyes only briefly glanced at the corpse of the chair before noticing the towels I'd dropped. Ah, you found them. Great. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to dab the blanket. Wouldn't want the tea soaking through to my legs and bringing me a chill later. Her utter lack of regard for my shocked state in the corpse, which I only then noticed radiated a carnal stench more awful than anything I'd ever smelled, told me that she had known about it the entire time. Weakly, my nerves barely operated in my fright. I pointed to the corpse, and the woman looked at it again. Only this time, she clapped her hands and shouted, Oh! as if noticing a pet that she had yet to introduce to me. So you've met Elizabeth. She is, well, was, my caretaker. A sweet girl, single mother of uh, two boys, who I've been told are the best. She's been with me for, let's see, four months now. And before her was Yolanda. And before that was a young man. Uh, you would have loved him. Marcus, I think his name was. Yeah, he was a nice boy. They were all so nice. So helpful, just like you've been. The woman's demeanor hadn't changed. She spoke as if she was recalling old friends. And yet, on an instinctual level, I immediately understood that I was in grave danger. The blanket was still wrapped around her, trailing damply on the floor. I hadn't noticed before, I hadn't gotten a sense of her stature when she'd been seated, but in that room, with her standing only a few feet away, I realized for the first time how tall she was. She towered over me, standing at a height that was undoubtedly at least six foot five, and adding to the strangeness of her erected form was that her legs, from what I could tell through the cover of the blanket, were incredibly long disproportionately so in relation to her torso. Now why don't I grab these towels from you, and we can head back to the other room and finish our tea. I think I'm ready for that story now. I stood there, frozen by fear and uncertainty, as the woman calmly approached me, but instead of bending over and reaching down for the towels, something she'd logically have to do given her very natural height, she instead lifted the blanket and the gown beneath and outstretched something that was not a leg, but an appendage that 
resembled a thickly corded drawstring. But this limb was made of lustrous black flesh rather than a tightly woven thread, and it moved with an unsettling dexterity. At the end of the monstrous limb were several fat digits that writhed in an undulant, repulsive manner, and with these she grasped the towel and raised them up to her torso, where she received them with her human arms. The horrible limb was then retracted back beneath the gown, and before she let the fabric fall, I saw others. A veritable trunk of tautly wound black cords with which the freed limb re-entwined itself in a manner that was efficient as it was sickening. She then lowered the gown, threw the blanket over the chair-seated corpse, and dabbed the damp spot with the towels. Once satisfied, she wrapped the blanket around herself and returned to the living room, beckoning me to follow as if nothing out of the ordinary had happened. Dumbstruck, horrified, I... I followed against my will. I was led into the room as if under some spell. I returned to my seat across from her and, with the mindless mechanical motions of one whose willpower had been entirely depleted and supplanted by another's, I read from the book that I brought. It was a collection of short stories by Arthur Macon. She'd mentioned on the phone that she'd enjoyed stories about weird and mythical things, and after finishing three stories, she again clapped her hands, signifying that I should stop. I closed the book and I laid it on my lap, whilst my brain struggled to come to terms with the unprecedentedly bizarre circumstances. The woman applauded my narration, even though I couldn't remember adding any sort of vocal flavor to the reading. It had been fairly straightforward, done almost absent-mindedly. I thanked her for the compliments and tried to blink away the tears that uncontrollably swelled beneath my eyes. Now I think we arrived at the time. I can't thank you enough for this wonderful afternoon. I'm so thankfully grateful for your company. A woeful old woman like myself couldn't have asked for a better companion to sit vigil with her. Thank you, child. I have initially planned on incorporating you into the family, but now I just can't bring myself to do that. I've truly been the best of all those who've sat with me during my ends. The plural of that final word and the dreadful, vague connotation of it broke me completely. The tears fell and I sunk inward, entirely consumed by terror. The woman, misinterpreting my fear of her for sadness at her imminent passing, urged me not to cry, saying that death comes to everyone eventually. Her demeanor then became suddenly and strikingly somber, and she asked if I'd kindly leave her to be alone. Needing no further motivation, I arose from my seat, leaving behind everything I'd brought, and sprinted out of the living room. But before I could reach the front door and return to the normal, sunlit world, she called out, Oh, your payment is on the Davenport, the sofa, in the white envelope. After a brief war of wills, the broke and hungry student versus the terrified human, I I begrudgingly returned to the room, and careful, Dickie my eyes focused on the sofa that sat just beside the room's entryway, and while I never looked directly at the woman, I glimpsed and heard her awful transformation into something else, perceived audibly and peripherally the death of her human shell. I escaped the house without having witnessed the full exposure of that abominable thing that had clothed itself in human skin for who knows how long, and had hidden itself amongst mankind through cycles of life that assuredly dated back further than the house's memorabilia would have had you believe. As I stumbled down the driveway, I happened to glance inside the car parked there and was given one final parting moment of horror. The car hadn't belonged to the old woman. Its owner, I think, was Elizabeth. In the back seat, I saw two children's backpacks, but no sign of the children themselves. In about two hours, I made fifteen hundred dollars, and yet... I'd give it all back to erase my memories of that twisted afternoon. I can only hope that the police, who I called shortly after departing, could bring some kind of closure to the families of the victims... 
justice to the murderer whose death I doubt had any permanent meaning. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast if you happen to be listening to this as a podcast or as a YouTube or however else you managed to have found this story for tonight. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who's supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months. And things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane. And I mean that with all sincerity, that you guys have helped me immensely. So, in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fensky, Jeff Burnett, Diana Krause, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster, Pepper Squeezer, Gaddis, Joseph Calarudo, Rudy B, Dante Kincaid, Foxhound 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff the Killer's Cultist, Love You M&M, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Emma Cork, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Captain Scurvy, Escadine, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sec Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinium, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tri Magazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Limchok, Dirk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sam, Chelly J, Bacamel, The Leader Count, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Peter Chip, Acid System, Mom. Kiri the Sloth, Vester's Lampshade, Nico Kaya, The Ginger Bros, and Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night, and sweet dreams.